Now, EEG, there's a lot of misperception about EEG that it can be um, helpful in diagnosing epilepsy, for example. But don't forget that you can have normal children with an abnormal EEG, for example, slowed background, but you can have also uh, an abnormal EEG in a, uh, sorry, um, an abnormal child, let's say with uh, epilepsy, that the EEG at that given uh, point in time did not show any epileptic activity. But we do use it to help to determine the type of epilepsy, for example, uh, if the seizures uh, oh, and if the seizures are precipitated by photic or light factors, so they can do photostimulation, it, it helps to decide prognosis in some of the cases. Uh, it helps to decide what drug treatments will be the most appropriate. Uh, and then it can help to decide whether to continue or discontinue anti-epileptic drug treatment. Now, some other things that are not mentioned there. We also use it in uh, subclinic to, to detect subclinical seizures. So there will be a seizure activity, um, but not necessarily showing as such. Uh, and then I put there ECG because we, we should always remember to do an ECG in a child presenting with a seizure because it could be um, something else. It could be done to cardiac abnormality and arrhythmias. And then just a final slide on seizures, uh, just to mention uh, something on treatment. Uh, we don't always need to rush to treat um, uh, seizures uh, because of the vast number of paroxysmal events that can present like seizures. It's uh, when you diagnose epilepsy, though, and you, when you had um, at least one event that had more than five minutes or they presented with a status uh, epilepticus, then you have to prescribe rescue medication. And this could be um, the in the first, uh, as a first line, it could be benzodiazepines, so bacalmidazolam, for example, but then they might need escalation, like loading with phenytoin or phenobarbitone, if not already on that, um, uh, levetiracetam, so Keppra, and so on. And then, of course, regular anti-epileptic drugs. So there's a vast number of these, uh, but as a as a general rule of thumb, for generalized uh, seizures, you will use uh, sodium valproate, for example, uh, or levetiracetam, and then depending, because if it's a girl of uh, childbearing age, you will go into things like lamotrigine instead of sodium valproate because of the uh, fetal toxicity. Um, there's other things like ketogenic diet when epilepsy is refractory and not responding to medications. And the theory is because the cellular function is uh, depending on ATP, then uh, if you rearrange the metabolic activity, it can reduce the firing of the cells and, and that's reducing the seizures. Uh, and there's the rule of threes. They're like 30% effective, 30% some reduction and 30% no difference. Uh, vagal nerve stimulation is another approach to management of especially refractory seizures uh, or uh, encephalopathies. Uh, and this is this works by sending signals that may increase the blood flow to the high epileptogenic areas, uh, but the actual mechanism is a bit unknown. Um, epilepsy surgery, especially in lesional uh, seizures and early on in life. Uh, and then there's a lot of talk about cannabinoids lately and uh, the use of that. Uh, new medications have been discovered all the time, but that's beyond the remit of this presentation. Now we go to something different. Um, in the meantime, whilst I'm presenting, if someone wants to comment on or ask something about uh, how's it going, please use the chat and I'm going to keep an eye on that. Uh, so head injuries, I included it because it's extremely common and not all head injuries will lead to a neurological presentation, but I just included the concerning features here and then another slide on when to CT children, so when to do computer tomography for the brain. Um, so when there is weakness, loss of consciousness of more than five minutes, abnormal drowsiness uh, post the episode, three or more discrete episodes of vomiting. Now, there is a reason why we put discrete, because if a child hurts themselves, then they, it's a reflex reaction that they will get so upset, adrenaline rush, and then they might vomit. And they might vomit back to back in the uh, first time immediately after the uh, head injury. Now, that doesn't mean that we will do a CT 
scan for that child. But if the episodes are very discreet and far apart, then uh, it's a concern because it can mean increase into cranial pressure. Um, the other thing is when the mechanism of injury is very dangerous, for example, high-speed road traffic accident, even if they were passengers or, or um, not, then they should uh, be considered for a scan. Fall from a height of more than three meters, high-speed injury from a uh, hit by an object, and so on. Uh, also, if they have amnesia, undergrade or retrograde of more than five minutes in, uh, again, but it's very difficult in pre-verbal children to assess that. So if they look very confused and not their normal selves, again, they should be considered for uh, imaging. Uh, and I included some more stuff of when we do a CT scan. So in pediatrics, it's extremely important to always consider non-accidental injury in head injuries, uh, especially if the mechanism does not match the history the, the, of the history does not match the presentation. Um, in post-traumatic seizures, but without a history of epilepsy or what we will see later, something called breath holding attacks and so on, then again, we should be considering. And then reduction of the GCS, the uh, uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, usually they say less than 14 or for children under one year, less than 15. Now this will be difficult to assess in an unwell child, but, uh, but again, uh, there's modified scales. If you have an open or depressed skull injury or tense fontanelle, again, uh, we should be imaging. I mean, in that case, one can argue we can use an ultrasound scan in the first instance to see for a bleed and then consider a CT scan. Um, but if you have in an older child signs of hemotympanum, uh, panta eyes, cerebrospinal fluid leakage from the ear or nose, or battle sign, which is the um, uh, another sign of the eyes, for example, then they would uh, need a CT scan. Uh, if they have any abnormal focal neurology that was not there before in the examination, uh, or if they have a bruise or a laceration more than five centimeters. So these are always worrying uh, features in a head injury. Um, now we, we will look a little bit into headaches. Again, I'm not going to go into extreme detail, but we are going to look at classification to begin with. So the commonest headaches that present in childhood. Um, the primary headaches are migraine. Now, migraine is hugely underdiagnosed in children and it can occur in very young children, even uh, down to the age of four to six years of age. Um, now, tension headaches, now there's a name for it, which is chronic daily headaches. Uh, again, they're much more common uh, than migraine, but again, they may morph into migraine or lead into other headaches, especially if they take uh, constant medication for it, like paracetamol every single day or more than 15 days in a month, then it leads to medication overuse headache. Um, trigeminal neuralgia it falls into the category of cluster headaches or autonomic with autonomic features, and uh, that's thankfully very rare in um, pediatric population because it's quite a debilitating condition. Um, and then uh, differentiation, further differentiation, so uh, some trigeminal or autonomic features will be ptosis, uh, tearing, flashing, agitation and restlessness. Uh, the migraine will have photophobia, phonophobia, so fear to sound and light, uh, vertigo or dizziness, and, and always keep an open mind for that because it's a, it's a worrying sign and then pain, uh, which will be described as throbbing. Uh, now, in pediatrics, migraines start, can start bilateral, uh, and then they become more like hemicranians. So just keep an eye for that as well. Tension headaches are typically featureless. So if you have photophobia, phonophobia, so on, it's most likely migraine rather than a tension headache. The duration would also be important, which should be more than four hours to be a migraine. Um, and if we go to causes of headaches, there's lots, um, infection, fever, trauma, tumors, hypertension, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole list. There's much, much more to add to that list. 
Um, a simple approach will be the acronym SOCRATES. I don't know if uh, people have heard of that, but it stands for sight, onset, character of the pain. So if it's throbbing or dull or stabbing uh, radiation, so it doesn't spread anywhere else, uh, alleviating factors. So most report that if they sleep, uh, they tend to get better, uh, dark room and so on time and then you see at not just the duration of the headache but also the time of the day that it might be related to and it can be important uh, we will look at the brain tumors later exacerbating factors so noises um, or things like exams and so on and then sleep hygiene is always important to ask um, red flags uh, will be if the, the pain is occipital uh if there is nighttime uh headache that wakes them from sleep uh so i always ask them is it the headache that woke you up from sleep or did you wake up and then you felt you had headache because it makes a difference uh or if you have headache upon awakening in first thing in the morning it's also worrying um sudden onset or thumping so the so-called thunderclap headache which they describe as the worst headache ever um, that can be associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then if the headaches are non-responsive to treatment and very persistent uh, with an acute presentation, that's again worrying. Early morning vomiting uh, for consecutive days without any other symptoms, gastroenteritis or so on, in the context of a headache, again, it's worrying for in intracranial pressure. And then always ask for regression of skills uh, or problems with development. So if a child uh, managed to um, walk, for example, and then suddenly can't walk but just crawl, then again, it's um, a worrying feature to explore more. Investigations, uh, depending on the causation that we think, uh, if we think infection, then you do blood tests, lumbar puncture, uh, to exclude, for example, and, and measure the opening pressure to exclude race and coronal pressure. That's only when they're stable and well. Uh, imaging, I put a question mark because we mentioned the indications further up. Uh, and then if there's raised intracranial pressure, focal neurological signs and so on, then yes. If it's migraine, the imaging, so if you do an MRI to reassure that there's nothing. Uh, there is literature out there that suggests the reassurance only lasts for four months. So uh, scanning is usually not um, required in, um, in headaches. And then um, I've put further there if you think about blood vessel abnormalities in the brain and so on. And, and then I'm going to say only about the migraine management. There's so many other headaches that we cannot talk about at this presentation. So in migraine, if we think about uh, prophylaxis alone, then pisotifen, uh, which is an old antihistamine at 0 0.5 milligrams at night, is usually a good first line. Um, not too many side effects. They can be a bit sleepy. That's why we be give it at night. Um, and uh, another one is propranolol, um, so beta blockers, but this is contraindicated in asthma or in pre-existing cardiac arrhythmias. Um, so they always need a good history and an ECG as a baseline. Topiramate, um, again, we give it at 25 milligrams once a day at night, but uh, you have to be careful a little bit because if they have psychiatric problems, or uh, they're obese, it can uh, exacerbate both, both symptoms. The same with child-bearing uh, age uh, females. I mean, triptyline is a very good prophylaxis in cases when there is also background of um, psychiatric conditions, for example, depression and so on. Um, and then two to 11 year old, we start at the high, do at a very low dose, uh, 200 to 500 micrograms per kilo again at night, um, and in 12-year-olds uh, and over, you go to, you start once a day at 10 milligrams, you could go up to 70 milligrams, but um, I've never needed to do that. They usually spawn up to 20 or 30 maximum. Um, and then uh, if there's a heart block, uh, arrhythmias, porphyrias, or bipolar disorder, again, it's amitriptyline is contraindicated.
And then a bit on the acute treatment of migraine, uh, moving on from the prophylaxis. Um, so rest, hydration, and avoidance of triggers is the mainstay of the acute treatment. Uh, if we do need to give medication, then first line is uh, ibuprofen or another NSAID uh, and paracetamol. But we tell them to limit it to twice weekly to avoid the medication overuse headache. Second line will be a, a triptan. So, for example, uh, sumatriptan, um, but you can give that in combination with paracetamol or ibuprofen. Uh, and some children that cannot uh, take or they have uh, they need a faster onset of, um, uh, of action, then you can uh, use the nasal triptan. Um, also, it's recommended to use an anti-emetic, uh, such as ondansetron, metoclopramide, or prochlorperazine, um, if they're nauseous or vomiting with the migraines. Uh, if it's very severe migraines, even in the absence of nausea, you can consider it as well. And then other treatments that are not so commonly used is greater occipital nerve injections. Uh, so it's a combination of a steroid and a lignocaine. Uh, Botox, but we, we never use it in children because it involves 32 injections in the face uh, area and so on in the skull. And then new treatments include things like monoclonal antibodies and so on. Um, People also like to look at alternative remedies. So things like uh, we, we can suggest an acupuncture course up to 10 sessions over five to eight weeks. Um, there's things like transmagnetic cranial stimulation and uh, other alternatives. Um, now, any questions so far? Either like any burning kind of uh, questions for the headaches or the epilepsies that we mentioned so far? Again, it's a run through of basic stuff um, at this stage. So we'll move on to brain tumors then. And uh, I included it because it, unfortunately in the, UK, in the UK, we have a delay in presentation, um, but also delay in diagnosis. And uh, we have to identify certain red flags. There is a website called HeadSmart. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat now because it's, um, it's very good. And it was written by, it was created by a family who lost a child to a brain tumor to raise awareness. Um, the... Um, and we will talk about also some initial management, for example, dexamethasone for vomiting uh, and pressure or versus a chemotherapy or surgery if eligible. Now, the commonest brain tumors in childhood are things like astrocytomas, ependymomas, medulloblastomas, or slow-growing gliomas, and so on. Um, so presentation, and we can go by, uh, again, location. So you have the so-called supratentorial uh, central posterior fossa uh, tumors and brainstem tumors, so infradentorial. Uh, and if we go to posterior fossa uh, tumors, so the symptoms will be typically nausea and vomiting in 75%, headache in 67%. Now, what I wanted to mention here is that you never get, or very rarely you will get isolated headache in a brain tumor. So usually if they come headache and they're worried about brain tumor, they usually other associated features. Um, abnormal gait and coordination difficulties like ataxia is uh, in 60% presentation uh, in posterior fossa. And things like abnormal eye movements, lethargy, nausea are less common. And the, the whole list is there. I'm going to make the slides available to you um through RILA if if anyone wants them um and then this is a generic slide for um presentation signs so all children would have this vague or generic kind of presentation of uh, symptoms so headache nausea and vomiting abnormal gait and coordination papilledema seizures uh squints and so on um the worrying things in this list for all children will be headache and in combination with weight loss and so on and the red flags I mentioned earlier. However, in children under four years of age, 
the things that we need to pay more attention to is things like macrocephaly, um, irritability, lethargy, weight loss, and a headache, which very rarely reported, or they will, in, in nonverbal children, they might be banging their head with their hand because it's hurting, and, or they might be very, extremely irritable. Um, so moving to some supradentorial uh, tumors and how they will present. So uh, uh, there would be signs of recent cranial pressure in 47%, seizures in 38%, uh, papillidema 21%, focal neurological signs depending on location 17%, and then the, less are, the, the rest are less frequent. So headache would be only in 11% of, of cases. Central tumors. Uh, so, for example, there's a, a picture there of um, a huge tumor around the thalamus area and the ganglia area. So, headache in 49%, abnormal eye movements and squint in 21%, nausea and vomiting, reduced visual acuity, and some unspecified symptoms and signs of race into cranial pressure. The rest, again, is a big list. I'm not going to go through all of it, but less so uh, in at presentation. Um, and then what, when to worry in addition to the signs is persistence. So if you have two weeks of continuous nausea and vomiting, motor system abnormalities or visual system abnormalities, um, always include this in your differential diagnosis. It doesn't always mean it's a brain tumor, but have it in your differential diagnosis. Same if you have four weeks of continuous headache. Um, again, we see lots of chronic headaches that are not brain tumors, but in an acute presentation, onset of headache with uh, persistence of four weeks included in your differential. So presentation can be variable, age dependent on, and location dependent. Uh, commonly headache, nausea and vomiting, visual or motor system abnormalities, development abnormalities would be red flags. And although it might mimic many uh, common conditions, um, please always um, know your red flags and include differential. Now, uh, moving on, I thought to include Bell's palsy because a lot of children will present uh, with Bell's palsy and it's the commonest cause of facial paresis in children. Uh, you can have acute, it's, it, sorry, it's an acute unilateral lower motor neuron facial nerve palsy which is not associated with other cranial neuropathies or brainstem dysfunction. Because if you have that, you always have to look for differentials, other diagnosis more worrying. Um, maximal facial weakness occurs within 72 hours of onset with 90% resolution within one month and 100% resolution within one year. Recurrence is common in 7% of the affected individuals within 10 years. And rarely we get um, a chronic recurrent presentations. A ch child, especially in genetic causes of idiopathic Bell's palsy, uh, you can get siblings that present with recurrent um, palsy. Uh, now, rarely it can be bilateral. Um, I have to admit I've never seen bilateral palsy, um, at least within my own practice. Now, etiology, the cause is usually unknown. Uh, in some cases, it occurs two to three weeks post viral illness, hence the theory of reactivation of viruses, for example, herpes simplex one from cranial nerve ganglia. Um, and this matches with the incidence being higher in winter months. Uh, a diagnosis, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, so it's very important to differentiate from other serious pathologies especially in under two years of age. So things like stroke, meningism, encephalitis, hypertension, ocular or auditory lesions. So for example, in neuro, neurofibromatosis type two, when you get acoustic neuromas, um, or osteopetrosis, when the um, canal, the auditory canal gets, the bone gets thickened and then it compresses the nerve, uh, or tumors and so on. Um, be a bit more specific on etiology. So idiopathic, again, is the most likely cause in, in most of the cases. Uh, infective, so if it's herpes zoster um, and you see vesicles in the, in the auditory canal, then we call it Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Uh, the 
uh, varicella cellular zoster virus can cause it as well. Autoimmunity issues like mums, mycoplasma, Lyme disease, rickettsia, cat scratch, meningitis, encephalitis, all of this can uh, lead to Bell's palsy. Uh, intracranial uh, lesions um, can also lead to that, and we mentioned earlier a few, like neurofibromatosis, neurofibromatosis 2. I'm not going to repeat those. Auricular issues, systemic issues, and inflammatory. Um, so I, I'm not going to read out the list. Um, this is no, not exhaustive. There's a lot more. Um, a little bit on Ramsey hand syndrome. So suspect if there's severe pain, oh, sorry, if there's severe pain or presence of a rash in the ear or a sore throat, uh, tongue or palate on the affected side. Um, dizziness, vertigo, and tinnitus may also point to Ramsey hand syndrome. And then a small number of people uh, might not even have a rash. The assessment, so initially we all try to differentiate if it's upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron. In a lower motor neuron lesion, the patient can wrink, cannot wrinkle their forehead. The final common pathway to the muscles will be destroyed. The lesion must be either in the pons or outside the brainstem. So posterior fossa, bony canal, middle ear, or outside the skull. In an upper motor neuron lesion, the upper facial mus muscles are partially spared uh, because of alternative pathways in the brainstem. For example, the patient can wrinkle their forehead, and the rest depending on the etiology, uh, but blood pressure is also, uh, uh, and sorry, Bell's palsy is one of the etiologies. Now, management and prognosis. So in uh, children, there, there's huge controversy as to the use of steroids uh, and or acyclovir. The, uh, the, the census is that if a child presents it's, it's acutely within 72 hours from presentation, then oral prednisolone, one milligram per kilo per day for a week, uh, can help. The um, acyclovir, uh, you can consider if it's Ramsey hand syndrome, um, but not in all other cases of Bell's palsy. Eye care is very important. So if they cannot shut their eye, then you have to tape it to prevent drying and abrasion and so on. And then surgical decompression is not recommended in children unless there's a congenital or acquired facial palsy, uh, then they can consider something called dynamic facial reanimation. Uh, and I just I just grabbed this from the facial palsy um, website. Uh, if people are interested to go there and see this, an acronym. So purple rash is an acronym for Ramsey hand syndrome. So P for pain, U for unsteady, red rash, palsy, loss, exception, and uh, the rash is for the management. So rapid, uh, if the treatment is within 32 hours, antiviral, steroids, and highlight. Uh, so the eye care. So um, a little bit now on what we call fits and funny turns or paroxysmal events. So essentially some of the differentials of epilepsies. Um, these are many, we cannot see all of them here. And I have a very nice video presentation that I will do at another time for you guys. Um, Post-traumatic seizures can present as one. So immediate are the ones that present within 24 hours post a head injury. Uh, early post-traumatic seizures are the ones that present from a day to a week. And then the late post-traumatic seizures are the ones that uh, occur a week or longer after the trauma. And these are the ones that are concerning because they can lead to, the prognosis is poor as far as uh, epilepsy um, development is uh, concerned. The immediate seizures I thought the mechanism is thought to be just stimulation from the injury itself and acutely, but the prognosis is actually good that they will fully recover. But the late seizures are usually believed to result from either damage to the cerebral cortex, um, and the mechanism could be excitotoxicity from glutamate release or iron accumulation uh, because of blood accumulation from the injury. Um, another fits and fun test is reflex syncopes and faints, and we see a lot of that. 
Um, so syncope is a sudden loss of consciousness and postural tone associated with a cutoff of energy substrates to the brain to a decrease in cerebral perfusion or drop in oxygen content. And common presentation is either when they stand up very, very suddenly after sitting down for a long time, or when they go into the shower and they use very hot water, it causes vasodilation uh, to the skin vessels and then the temporary lack of oxygen to the brain and they fall. Um, other stimuli can be emotional uh, or stress, and then uh, it can have an abrupt onset. Clonic movements can occur in 50%, hence the confusion with seizures or epilepsy. And even in 10%, you can have urinary incontinence. So people who refer and say, well, it must be a seizure or epilepsy because there was also urinary incontinence, um, it's not always the case. Um, they're often familiar if they're vasovagal and the hypoxia may induce um, a seizure, but it, again, it does not mean that it will evolve into an epilepsy. Um, breath holding spells, again, extremely common presentation in children, uh, and 4% of children less than five years will have that. Uh, and we separate them into the cyanotic and the pallid uh, breath holding attacks. The pallid ones are also called reflex hypoxic syncopies or reflex anoxic seizures. The, uh, going back to that, sorry, just an example of that, a child goes for, uh, hits their head accidentally or, or they want to play with a toy and another child is grabbing the toy from them. Then they cry and they cry to the point that they, they will hold their breath and they can become very cyanotic, even lose consciousness. And they might even posture and become tonic, hence confused a lot with epilepsies. Um, paroxysmal disorders of sleeps. Again, we see a lot of these. Um, so uh, things like night terrors, typically from 18 months to five years of age, and usually um, early part of the night and in deep sleep, whereas headaches, uh, sorry, whereas nightmares usually occur during the rapid eye movement uh, uh, part of the sleep. There's also something called uh, rhythmic movement disorders of sleep, and an example is the one I have in red here, the Jactatio capitis nocturna, which is basically at onset of sleep, the child will bang the head against the, uh, the bedboard, and, and it's quite dramatic. But it's benign, uh, and it's not a form of epilepsy. Um, somnambulism, uh, uh, or sleepwalking, so it's the big movements during sleep. Hypnagogic phenomena, so phenomena that occur whilst uh, we're going into sleep. So, for example, you will have a, like a, temp a very temporary a uh, very vivid hallucination as we are going into sleep. Uh, other things are abnormal movements in sleep, such as restless legs. And if you have a child with restless legs, then check their iron for iron deficiency uh, because it's associated. Other things associated will be B12 deficiencies and so on. And then last but not least is uh, narcolepsy. So the uh, the excessive sleepiness, even daytime sleepiness. And this is usually associated with what we call cataplexy, which is sudden postural drop, um, usually following an emotion. And then we see again a lot of non epileptic seizures. You might know these or used to know these as pseudo seizures. And the terminology changed uh, for. Um, basically, um, it's very frequent in adolescents, but has been reported in children as young as four years of age. It might have an apparent intractability. It might be difficult to distinguish from epileptic events and may mimic any type of seizure. The movements will not be typical. Uh, they will be clonic, uncoordinated, semi-purposeful, an expression, and you could not fit that into any stereotype. Um, they are received usually immediately after the episode, which is, is another give out. And then average duration of the attack is 5.6 minutes, some longer. So usually this is longer than even uh, epileptic events. Um, 
prolonged video EEG recording might be useful to uh, um, basically reassure them and then approach the management. Cataplexy, we mentioned earlier, sudden brief loss of voluntary muscle tone triggered by strong emotions such as laughter with narcolepsy. I'm not going to go into details. It can occur with some other disorders such as Neiman Pick's type C disease, Prader Willi, Wilson's disease, stroke, MS, somatosclerosis, sclerosis, head injury, and encephalitis. Um, there's no particular cure for this, but sleep hygiene, stress management, and avoidance of triggers can help. Ticks, another big category of uh, like a big chunk of things that we get in clinic. So ticks are repeated, individually recognizable and intermittent movements that are almost always briefly suppressible. Um, and they're usually associated with awareness of an urge to perform the movement. Now you will see, you will ask the parents, for example, like when do you notice it more? If it's when the child is focusing, let's say watching TV or reading a book, then it's more likely to be a tick than anything else, like seizures and so on. Um, now they manifest in very in many different ways. The vast majority is um, sudden, brief, intermittent movements like motor ticks or utterances, so vocal ticks. Um, they uh, seize during sleep uh, in other conditions, for example, dystonias or dyskinetic movements. Those will not necessarily seize during sleep. Um, and then if you have ticks, though, that begin abruptly, uh, they're persistent, so more than a year uh, duration, uh, because under a year, they're still considered transient tick disorder. Uh, if you have complex motor tics, so the movement is very complex and involves different muscle groups, or they're very problematic, then think of other secondary causes in, in these situations. Um, and an example would be Tourette syndrome, for example, uh, when you have presence of multiple motor and phonic tics uh, that last more than one year, and the onset is usually before the age of 18. Now, this is a very interesting slide, and I, and I want you guys to try and remember. So if you have functional presentations, if you think that is not organic, then these are some tests that can help. So there's something called the Hoover sign in people who come and say, well, my leg is weak. I can't move my leg. Then the hip extension weakness will improve if you ask the contralateral hip to flex against resistance. So they will um, non -voluntary, let's involuntarily move the other leg as well. Um, this the hip ad abductor sign. So abduction weakness will improve with contralateral hip abduction against resistance. Uh, and then you have the functional movement disorders. So if they present with what looks like dystonia, um, it will present typically in a fixed position rather than um, intermittent and random, and usually a clenched fist or inverted ankle. Uh, facial dystonia will present with an, uh, if it's functional, will present with episodic contraction of the platysma or orbicularis oculi muscles. Um, the tremor, so when they present with tremors, and we get a lot of adolescents presenting with that, the left wrist tremor will stop or entrain when uh, copying examiner's movements with the other hand. And then finally, if you have the functional dissociative seizures that we just described uh, in the previous slides, um, these should be uh, diagnosed on basis of finding characteristic features. For example, if the eyes are tightly closed during the episode, if there's tearfulness, if it's longer than five minutes, and we said the average duration was 5.6 minutes, or side-to-side -side head shaking or hyperventilating, then you usually have a high index of suspicion that is not organic. Um, I, I will uh, make these slides, I said earlier on, available to you guys, uh, because I just think they're really helpful sometimes. 
Um, and then I'm, I'm barely touching on this. It's very important, but for the sake of time. So idiopathic intracranial hypertension, we see it uh, very commonly in uh, high BMI uh, adolescents. Um, it's, it's a little understood condition. Um, and uh, usually one sign of, the first sign of presentation will be papilledema or swollen optic disc. And they are typically sent to us by an optician um, to, to review. Headaches is another common presentation, and then we pick on that. Um, in more than 50%, you will see obesity uh, and in, in postpubertal, but now increasingly we see prepubertal children that present with that due to high BMI. Um, management, so weight loss of 6 to 10%, at least in, in adult literature, improves the idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and it's even more effective than some classic drug therapies. In children in severe um, increased intracranial pressure, we do a therapeutic lumbar puncture. So you do, in a sense, it's diagnostic, and you see the opening pressures, and if they're high, you can also release CSF to bring it down to 22 to 25 um, um, centimeters of water. And then that's also therapeutic, uh, at least temporary. If it's recurrent, then you have to think of other things as well, like medications and uh, or neurosurgery, depending on the course. Um, and then I just put there some other medications, which beyond the remit of this presentation, now, I have a clinical case just because I thought it's a very heavy presentation and I'm trying to cover as many things as possible. But I thought let's discuss this because nowadays it's very interesting and very common and, and we need to be aware. 15-year-old, usually fit and well, presented with numbness in arms and legs and typically described a four-week history of pins and needles in addition to the numbness to both legs, starting from the soles and going up to the thighs. There was a significant decline in mobility and using a walking stick for a 15-year-old. Um, there's also a two-week history of tingling in fingers, causing functional difficulties, for example, doing battles and typing. Now, please use the chat. Any thoughts? Like, what are your initial thoughts from this presentation? Any initial differential diagnosis? So any, any of you, it's not, it's not gonna be marked, don't worry. Oh, Saja, okay, Saja says B12 deficiency, Zabib says MS, more to the differential, MS from Chandler. Thank you, guys. Throw more. It's a much wider differential. Okay, Gillen Barre, very good. Any more? I mean, it could be, okay, recent viral illness. It could be functional. It could be Wilson's disease. It could be any other neurometabolic and so on. Thank you, guys. I mean, that was brilliant. We'll move on to see. Ooh. So has anyone seen any of these metal canisters, these cream chargers? Um, you can put in the chat if you've seen it and if, um, if you think it's relevant or how it's relevant. And Oh, Gabriella, okay, never seen that. So, um, London, Gabriella is littered. Um, every road I go to has um, a few of these checked uh, in, on the road, and they are considered to be the legal high. So they are nitrous oxide gas and uh, for cream weepers, and, but they, they buy them and they're really cheap. That's why I put the Amazon price there and so on for a box of a hundred and they sniff them. They either use the, um, uh, the cream canisters so on to sniff and this is the one that they can use or in balloons. 
And now even more worryingly, there is much bigger ones, the ones that you use for nitro in cars um, to speed the, the turbo of the car, that um, they use that for inhalation as well. So it causes a brain freeze, a temporary brain freeze, and they use it as a legal high. However, legal doesn't mean safe. And what this thing does to you, if it's chronic use of nitrous oxide, um, it gives you these kind of investigations. So, Saja, you mentioned vitamin B12 deficiency earlier on. And in a sense, you were bang on because you, this thing causes B12 deficiency. But you can have normal B12, um, including, but, but be deactivated. So your blood test might show a normal B12, but the function of it will not be there. And what you really get always is a raised homocysteine and a raised methylmalonic acid. Now, these two are your indications that um, they can get these vitamin B12 symptoms. Now, the, what it causes in the beginning, if you use it very, for a very short period of time, it can be reversible. If it's used chronically, it causes subacute combined degeneration of the cord. So basically, the dorsal column and the lateral column are both affected. And it's non-reversible. And it's really sad because we get a lot of young adolescents now coming with this permanent damage now. Um, and it's really sad. And as you see, people did think of the things that you said, guys. So they thought of Gillen Barry, that's why the lumbar puncture, they thought of other stuff. Now, um, before, before I go to the next slide, a quick mention on homocysteine. So it, it's prothrombotic, so it can cause stroke. So I have, I just published a, cases, a, ser a case series of three presentations in children. One was subacute combined degeneration of the cord because of this nitrous oxide and B12. The other one was um, stroke, but that was because of parents, extreme vegetarians, and the, the baby, the child was born with vitamin B12 deficiency that increased the homocysteine, and the homocysteine was prothrombotic. And the third case was a four-year-old girl with pancytopenia. So zero neurological signs, but the bit of deficiency called um, very significant bone marrow deficiency. So just, just to be aware of these things is uh, it's interesting. Now, reaching to the end, I thought to put some light facts, interesting facts about the brain. So at its peak growth rate, the developing brain can produce 250,000, so a quarter of a million neurons per minute. Um, it doesn't stop at birth. Um, and by two years, it um, forms 80% of adult size, then 86 billion neurons and 180,000 kilometers of fibers. Um, and also, if you think our brain has 10 trillion synapses, now that's more than the leaves on the Amazon trees. Now, I don't know who on earth when in measured or counted the leaves on the Amazon trees, but it's, it's quite impressive to think about that. Um, but despite all of that, it works only on 20 watts. So it's less energy than a light bulb. So that's why when you see things about brilliant ideas, you see a light bulb on top of your head. And then uh, it's estimated that our brain can hold one petabyte of memory. Now, I have no idea what a petabyte is, but apparently it's, it accounts for 2,000 years of uh, MP3 music. I just thought a few interesting things there. And the last slide, um, I think, is this. So there's a lot of talk about microbiome. And the microbiome is part of, so the normal gut bacteria, the flora, uh, and there's a lot of money now on probiotics, prebiotics, and everything. And there's the so-called gut-brain axis. And it, uh, this is proven now, and there's a lot of more literature coming up, that uh, you get all the, this feedback of um, the microbiome and neuroendocrine immune mediators affecting the brain, and then back to the the, how the brain affects the gut and so on. 
so the old generations used these um, sayings like I have a gut feeling or feeling gutted. Trust your gut, go with your gut, gut instinct, gut wrenching and gutsy move. And it, they knew something and we have a lot to learn from the past as well. Um, and a lot of children that present actually, like there's a lot of talk now about babies, treating babies, for example, the antibiotics and the microbiome and so on. But of course, we have to balance everything because, um, it, you know, antibiotics can save a life as well. So thank you, guys. This was a, a very quick run through and I hope, I really hope I didn't tire you. Um, it's not my usual uh style let's say of presentation usually i do it a little bit more interactive so i hope i didn't uh, cause a lot of uh, boredom um but we i have other presentations in relation to this uh, that with nice videos and interactions and we can uh, organize those in the future as well um so thank you and if any other questions please feel free to add them to the chat Thank you very much, Dr. Lucas. It's Marcus McKenzie at RELA. And um, I'd just like to thank everyone on behalf of RELA Institute of Health Sciences for joining us today. And I hope that you found it useful. So that really is the end, unless there are any other questions. Thank you, Marcus. I I'm going to make the slides available to, to people uh, if they're interested. So I'm going to send you an email and then um, I'm very happy for, for them to be, to be shared. Uh, and if they want... Any more subjects, please, guys, can you suggest subjects that you're interested for in the future uh, to Rila, and then I can, I can accommodate for that. And thank you for being so interested.